have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. Hello, my name is Dave Burns and I'm here to tell you about the welcoming party we are having for new students. Unfortunately, the information on your invitation is inaccurate. We didn't have enough time to print new invitations, so I'll have to ask you to make changes. To start with, this isn't a welcoming lunch, it's a dance party. However, the next line is true. The party will be held at Blackwell House. Is everybody comfortable with that? The next line tells you when the party will be. Friday, June 15th at 8pm. But I have good news. The party will end at 11pm. As a result of this later end to the party, the bus will go later too. So it should read, Free transport to the student hostel is available, leaving Blackwell House at 11.30. And of course, other students may attend, and all students must have their student ID card with them. I hope you can come to the welcoming party. It's a really good way to get to know other students and to learn what it's like to live in this city and to study here. Just one final change. Please let us know by Thursday if you can come. Now listen while Dave Burns gives instructions for students who are going to travel by car to the party. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Some of you may prefer to travel by car, but I have to warn you about some changes to the roads. You will find there is a lot of new road work on Smith Street. The work will not finish for a long time, so we can be sure that Smith Street will be a problem. If you are coming from the city, you will be able to travel easily until you get to Blackwell Street, just near the college. As you know, Blackwell Street is very long. You should avoid the corner of Blackwell Street and Jones Avenue because they are laying telephone cable. However, you can take a detour and avoid Blackwell Street altogether. The best thing to do is to pass the roundabout and take the first road on your left, which is Brown Crescent. Brown Crescent will lead you into the college grounds, so that's easy. I hope everyone has a great time. Bring your friends, and we'll see you on Friday. Oh, one final reminder. It's best to use the side door. The front door may be locked at 7, so come to the side. See you on Friday. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about ancient architectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20.
Now listen carefully to the tape and answer questions eleven to twenty. The architecture of the ancients often reflects the ideas and beliefs of that time. Some of the ancient structures can give us a glimpse into the minds of the people who built them. Now, Professor Francis is going to talk to us about ancient architecture. No story is more interesting or impressive than the story of architecture, and in particular the activities of human beings in the art of building. Let's have a look at this in some detail. Did you ever visit the pyramids? Look at this picture, please. The pyramids in Egypt are true wonders of the ancient world. Khufu's pyramid is a stunning 138 meter high mass of 2.3 million stones, each weighing about 2.5 tons. It was built to geometrical perfection over 4,500 years ago, with simple stone and copper tools. It was so far advanced that some have suggested it was designed by aliens. Actually, there is an astronomical significance to the perfect precision of the pyramids. By using two stars that circle the sky polar point, Egyptian astronomers were able to arrange the pyramids due north. This was done because they believed the king's afterlife and the stars were closely related. They believed their pharaoh, that is, their king, had been transformed into another living being. A light in the sky, in contrast to the darkness of death. Okay, now let's look at another picture. On this picture is Athens' ancient Parthenon. It is an immense columned temple built almost entirely of marble. Athens' ancient Parthenon is a perfect model of classic Greek architecture. It was built to honor Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Therefore, it includes the ideals of logic and reason in its design. Built in the fifth century BC, the Parthenon is made up of almost 140 columns. The Greeks associated the columns with the virtues of a human being: strong, orderly, proud, and beautiful. The height and width of the Parthenon are designed with the rational logic of geometry. The upper diameter of each column is a bit narrower than its base. It bulges slightly in the middle and slants inward. This kind of optical illusion makes the columns appear more graceful and thus more beautiful. The Parthenon also symbolizes democracy. Each column supports the entire structure, just as each person contributes to the government. It symbolizes that Athens' government is democratic. Finally, I am going to introduce the Roman Colosseum, a large oval structure for public sports events, entertainment, or assemblies. The Roman Colosseum displays the practical nature and political thinking of Romans. The Colosseum was built in 80 A.D. when, throughout its vast empire, Roman's population and wealth were growing. It was necessary for politicians to entertain the people in return for their support. Gladiators would battle wild animals, and even one another, in order to entertain the bloodthirsty crowds. Constructed with tons of marble, the Colosseum stood forty-eight meters high. It has the capacity to hold up to fifty thousand spectators. Spectators sat on the lower three levels, surrounded by towering roofed passageways. On hot days, a cover suspended from the top story provided shade from the sun. Ancient architecture gives us a sense of the different societies that build these amazing monuments. Through it, we can imagine what life was like when those civilizations were flourishing. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will hear a discussion between two students 
who have to describe a lawn sprinkler for part of their general science course. A lawn sprinkler is a machine designed to water gardens and lawns. In the first part of the discussion, the students are talking about the different parts of the sprinkler. Done for you. Now listen to the conversation and label the parts of the sprinkler on the diagram. Choose from the box. There are more words in the box than you will need. Hello, Scott. I believe you're going to be my partner for this practical session. Have you got the model set up? Yes,、uh, it's right here. The instructions say we have to describe it first and label the diagram. I've started from where the water enters the machine.、Uh, the water enters through a hose pipe, and then it turns a water wheel. You can see where the wheel is marked by an arrow pointing upwards. It's called a water wheel because it's designed so the water will catch against the wheel. This action spins a series of gears. How are you going to describe the gears? There are two worm gears, one vertical and one. Horizontal. The horizontal worm gear drives a circular gear. That gear is connected to a crank, which changes the motion. The crank is already labelled. Do you see the two white arrows? I see. Okay. The water has passed across the water wheel. Then what? Okay.、Um, then you could say the water passes through the spray tube. Yes, I see. And the water is then spread over the lawn through holes at the top of the spray tube. How are you going to describe the base? How about this? The sprinkler stands on a base consisting of two metal tubes, which join at a hinge at one end and continue into a plastic moulding at the other. That's certainly starting at the bottom. Do you want to mention that there's no water in the base? I don't think that's necessary. If you look at the diagram, it's easy to see that the only metal tube to contain water is the spray tube. You can actually see the water coming out of it. Now listen while Linda and Scott's instructor, Mark Stewart, talks to them. Answer questions. Hello, Scott, Linda. I'm glad I caught you before class. Did you know about the change in examination schedule? Change? Yes. The last day of examinations for your group will be December second instead of November twenty ninth. Is that definite? We were told they'd be on November twenty sixth, and then there was a rumour they'd be on December the first. The schedule's gone to the printer. There can be no changes. It's definitely December second.、Mm, that's a relief. I'm going to the U.S. on December the fourth. Are you one of the exchange students? Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to studying there. Do you know if their general science courses are anything like ours? It's not very likely. Actually, all basic general science courses are fairly similar. You'll find you're behind in some things and ahead in others. I wouldn't worry too much about the course. You've been doing well on this one. Linda, have you finished your assignment yet? I'm nearly there. I should be able to give it to you on Monday. That's good. I can't let you have another extension. I was really grateful for the extra time you gave me. That was a really big assignment. Well, I'll expect it next week. Now, would you like to hear the details of the timetable? Oh yes, please. I've just finished putting it on the notice board downstairs. Basically, you'll have four examinations. General mechanics is in the morning of December first. Physics and maths are on the afternoon of the same day. Communications and English are in the morning of December second, and Earth sciences in the afternoon. All over in two days. Yes, I'll miss teaching this class. You're all good at expressing your views, which makes for an interesting class. 
Some of the other first-year classes won't talk, and they're rather boring to teach. That is the end of section three. You will now have some time to check your answers. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between a tutor and a student about the strategies of note taking. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hi, Mr. Smith. I wonder whether you can spare several minutes with me. Sure. What's your name, please? John Murray. Good, John.、Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I am a freshman in the communication faculty. I quite enjoy the life here, except for the difficulty I have in the lectures. You know. I find it difficult to take notes when I listen. If I take notes on my notebook, I can't concentrate on the lecture. But I feel frustrated after the lecture if I don't write down anything. As we know, note taking is a complex activity which requires a high level of ability in many separate skills. At least four important skills are needed. Four? I don't expect so many. I think that needs one or two skills. Firstly, you have to understand what the lecturer says as he says it. That means you should try to develop the ability to infer the meaning of unfamiliar words from the context. You cannot stop the lecture in order to look up a new word or check an unfamiliar sentence pattern. Yes, that puts the non-native speaker like me under a particular severe strain. Often I may not be able to recognize words in speech, which I understand straight away in print. So the ability of inferring is important. Of course, you won't always be able to do this successfully. You must not allow failure of this kind to discourage you. However, it's often possible to understand much of a lecture by concentrating solely on those points which are most important. But how do I decide what's important? Well, that's in itself another skill I'd like to tell you. At first, the most important piece of information in a lecture is the title itself. If this is printed or referred to beforehand, you should study it carefully and make sure you're in no doubt about its meaning. A title often implies many of the major points that will later be covered in the lecture itself. It should help you, therefore, to decide what the main point of the lecture will be. Besides the title. What should I pay attention to during the speech? A good lecturer often signals what's important or unimportant. He may give direct or indirect signals. Many lecturers, for example, explicitly tell their audience that a point is important and that the student should write it down. Unfortunately, some lecturers who are trying to establish a friendly relationship with the audience. Are likely on these occasions to employ a colloquial style. He might say such thing as, "This is, of course, the crunch," or perhaps you'd like to get it down. Although this will help the student who's a native English speaker, it may very well cause difficulty for the non-native speaker. You'll therefore have to make a big effort to get used to the various styles of his lectures. I see. 
You mean I should get used to some colloquial expressions of the lecturer and write down the points he recommends us to take? That's right. And it's worth remembering that most lecturers also give indirect signals to indicate what's important. They either pause or speak slowly or speak loudly or use a greater range of intonation. Or they employ a combination of these devices when they say something important. So I should be aware of this and focus my attention accordingly. If I can catch the main points, how can I write them quickly and clearly? Good question. That's a problem that most students find hard to solve. Having sorted out the main points, you have to write them down. In order to write at speed, you may find it helps to abbreviate. You can also try to select only those words which give maximum information. There are usually nouns, but sometimes verbs or adjectives. Writing only one point on each line also helps you to understand your notes when you come to read them later. I see. The last but not least skill to learn is to show the connections between the various points you've noted. This can often be done more effectively by a visual presentation than by a lengthy statement in words. Thus, the use of spacing, of underlining, and of conventional symbols plays an important part in efficient note taking. In this way, you can see at a glance the framework of the lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. I think I'll employ the methods in the next lecture. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.